Hello everyone, this is Dr. Yasha Yadav, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, Hansraj College, University of Delhi. In today's lecture, we are looking at diversity of animals, the non-chordates from protists to pseudocelomates. Humans have a habit of making everything simple. There are thousands and millions and billions of organisms, living or organisms in this world, and we want to simplify it so that we can study. And that's what we have been doing since a long time. Since Aristotle, we have known classification of the animal world, of the living world, and then a sub part of it is the animal world. There are uh, millions of animals known in this world. And today, zoologists compile them together in 34 phyla. So presently, there are 34 phyla. All these phyla trace their origin to the Cambrian explosion, which occurred 600 million years ago. And at that point, the diversity of animal life was much more. We've come a long way since then. Uh, a lot of diverse evolutionary diversity happened and we have different forms of life existing presently. There have been several attempts since Aristotle's time to classify them because it's very difficult for us to study each of those species individually. So we try to group together uh, these organisms into categories dependent upon their body plan, their habit, their habitat, their developmental history, and other things. So when we look at the animal uh, classification today, we follow what is called as the three domain classification. The animals fall under the domain eukarya in it. The domain eukarya includes all the eukaryotic organisms. And when this do three domain classification was given, the purpose of it was not only classifying organism based on their morphology, their anatomy, their development, but also their evolutionary history, which is called as phylogeny. So the animal world falls into this domain eukarya, which includes those 34 phyla, which are some major and minor phyla. The minor phyla being which are not really known. There are not many species that belong to those phyla. And much is uh, unknown about them. Thus, we group them in minor. And then there are major, which we know a lot about. Then if you look at all these uh, eukaryotic animals, or uh, animal life as we know uh, uh, them as, they are very simple in their body plan or, and they can be very complex also. The simplest forms are grouped under the unicellular groups. At one point of time, uh, in the four kingdom, three kingdom and five kingdom classification, these unicellular groups were grouped together in kingdom protista. These included the unicellular eukaryotes. They had the colony forming habit also. Some of them do form colony, but they were unicellular eukaryotes. Today, kingdom protista doesn't hold the status of a taxon. And all those groups within the protista kingdom have been classified as phyla under the domain eukarya. So let us look at those unicellular groups. What is the key characteristic? And when we classify organism, we follow a hierarchical pattern. We start from the basic life forms and then we move ahead to higher forms. But in our understanding, sometimes we find there are new discoveries happening from time to time and we find that the hierarchy that we presume may not be exactly what we have understood. So the unicellular groups are the simplest eukaryotic organism and they represent what is called as the protoplasmic grade of organization that all that is there is that one cell. And that one cell is able to do every functionality, whether it is ingestion, whether it is digestion, whether it is assimilation, ejection, exchange of gases, osmoregulation, everything is done by that single cell. 
they show remarkable organization and division of labor but that division of labor is at a subcellular level at the level of cell organelles they have distinct supportive structures they have distinct locomotor devices the way the devices that they use to move about and they have simple yet very potent sensory structures as well the simplest way to learn about those unicellular groups of organism is to look at their uh, locomotor structure and with that we are able to understand them well so let me start with those unicellular protists the first category would be the amoeboids an example you must be knowing is amoeba that amoeba moves through these protoplasmic extensions these are the protoplasmic extensions that it forms and these protoplasmic extensions are called as pseudopodia using those pseudopodia it is able to capture its food and it is able to move so both of the things is done by this locomotor structure this pseudopodia can also be grouped and thus these amoeboids can be grouped in different types the pseudopodia can be very blunt end like you can see here it is having blunt finger like ends and that kind of pseudopodia is called as the lobopodia that kind of pseudopodia is called as lobopodia sometimes the pseudopodia rather than having those blunt ends would have very thin filamentous structure something like that and that kind of pseudopodia would be called as phylopodia then when these slender filamentous pseudopodia form a network pattern they collapse together and form a net like pattern that kind of pseudopodia would be called as reticulopodia and then lastly we have a pseudopodia where there is deposition in the center in the body in the protoplast there may be calcium carbonate strontium sulfate and like uh, all these depositions and that creates a straight axis like pseudopodia and that kind of pseudopodia is called as exopodia so it's just a single celled organism but you will have that diversity of that locomotor structure lobopodia phylopodia reticulopodia exopodia and thus you'll find different types of those amoeboids then if we look further ahead you'll see that the locomotor structure would change on your right you can see here a euglenoid moving through the use of flagellum so the second category would be called as flagellates on the basis of their locomotor structure which is flagella so the locomotor structure if singular if only one flagellum is there it is flagellum plural form is called as flagella and one single organism may have more than one flagellum also so you can see that this is that flagellum that is whip like structure that comes out it is able to gyrate it is able to extend it and then move about it originates from a structure called as basal granule if you look at this ultra structure of this flagellum it is composed of microtubules and those microtubules are arranged in a 9 plus 2 pattern while basal granule is also a microtubular structure but it is having 9 plus 0 pattern using this the animal is able to move faster compared to what it would have had it uh, compared to this pseudopodia bearing amoeboid so this is a slow locomotion but having flagellum makes them move a little faster so the second category would on the basis of the locomotor structure in those unicellular groups would be flagellates let's move ahead then you have the next group in this unicellular organism uh, that is called they, they are called as ciliates ciliates have cilia and that's always more than one that's why cilia singular form would be cilium cilia is the there are tiny hair like structures all over the body 
sometimes restricted to a certain regions in the body and that body I, uh, by the way is just a single cell they may be located in a groove like structure creating that uh, you know rotatory uh, current which brings the food in so they they may be located in near that cell mouth that is called a cytostome so there are ciliates and cilia are many in number all over the body they also in their ultra structure are made up of microtubules having that 9 plus 2 pattern and their basal granule also has microtubules which is 9 plus 0 pattern but one thing that is remarkably different from flagellum is the cilium one uh, is shorter in size secondly cilia may be connected inside the cell through infra ciliary system and when many cilia they are connected with to each other inside the cell there is rhythmicity in their movement so a lot of them will beat together and create a sort of current all over the body and that kind of current is called as metacronal rhythm you can imagine it like a grassland where the wind is blowing from one end to the other so you will see how the grasses bend and then they come back to their original position something like the cilia are bending all all over this organism an example would be paramecium a very common ciliate that you will find in fresh water ponds so cilia are the next category of those unicellular protists moving ahead you will see that some organisms despite having cilia or flagellum may have that this ability of constricting and relaxing their body and thus changing their shape this they are able to do because there are depressions grooves present in the body so rather than being a straight line like that they their their cell membrane would be or the body the cell body is something like this and thus it is able to constrict and elongate and that kind of structures are called as myonemes and this kind of movement is called as contractile movement all the different groups of unicellular protists may have this capacity of uh, contract contractility uh, it may vary how much they are able to contract but they some of them may have a flagellum may have a cilium but still have that contractility some may not have any other uh, locomotory structure may some may only just have those myonemes for their locomotion by changing that shape of the body they are able to wriggle about and thus move so this is the simplest way to classify those unicellular groups although certain ciliates all those ciliates may not be sharing a common ancestry all those flagellates may not be sharing a common ancestry but when we are grouping them in according to their locomotory structure it becomes easier for us to understand them one important thing to know here is that we may think that they are unicellular single cell they may not be complex and very simple in their plan but that's wrong So this is a video that was captured by one of our students from a drop of pond water analyzing it under a stereo microscope a simple uh, stereo binocular microscope he was able to locate a ciliate that is called a stenter and besides it you'll find a rotifer so stenter is a ciliate a single celled organism stenter is a ciliate and a single celled organism while rotifers are metazoans they are made up of multiple cells hundreds and thousands of cells and in this video you will be able to see that that single cell ciliate is much larger in size as compared to that rotifer which is made up of thousands of cells so let me play the video is not that clear but the attempt at capturing this beautiful organism is really good so there you can see that stenter a big bluish colored organism which is togged and on the sides here are multiple rotifers one is here the other is here much smaller in size compared to that stenter the mechanism that both of them are using 
is cilia only to capture the food. So that is also beating the cilia and that is creating a current pulling the food towards it. The rotifer on the side is also doing the same thing. That is a single cell. This is made up of thousands of cells. And that is the beauty of those unicellular groups. That they may be a single cell, protoplasmic grade of organization, but they are very complex within that cellular, uh, within that protoplasmic grade of organization. Let's move ahead to the multicellular organism, which we call as metazoans. So we say that multicellular animals have evolved to have a greater structural complexity because that they do it by combining all those cells and make larger units from them. So they are not single cell, those cells will combine together to form a larger unit of organism. And then we categorize them into different categories. They can be a uh, cellular grade of organization where the cells aggregate together and they are different from each other functionally. But there is just that random aggregation that is there, nothing else. Many zoologists classify the phylum Porifera under this cellular grade of organization. Then you have that transition from cell to tissue, so there is a cell tissue grade of organization where the cells they aggregate together but when they aggregate the similar kind of cells aggregate together and form a certain pattern and layers now this would become a tissue this layering and this tissue is not that defined in phylum porifera but still certain groups of zoologists they uh, put phylum porifera under this cell to tissue uh, you know trans uh, grade of organization not exactly cellular, not exactly tissue, somewhere in between. But truly that tissue grade of organization would be found in the phylum that is called as phylum Nideria. Then we move on to that tissue to organ grade of organization where the aggregation of tissues now forms organs. Tissue being made up of a single type of cell aggregated together and making tissue, but organ has different types of tissues. Then here you will see the platyhelminths would be the flatworms are characterized into that tissue grade organization. And then from tissue or organ, because there is a transition, some organs are also found in platyhelminths. The nematodes, roundworms also have organ and then organ system level of organization also because organ system grade of organization is where lot of different organs they come together and work to perform a particular function like for example digestion, excretion, respiration and all of that. So when organs aggregate and perform a single type of function that will be called as the organ system grade of organization. A lot of organism thus uh, are somewhere in the junction, they are neither the cell, cellular, not completely tissue, or they may be tissue, uh, they may have certain organs, but not many organs. So somewhere in between they may be. For certain organisms, we can always say that they are cellular or tissue or organ or organ system grade of organization. Now let's begin and look at those multicellular organisms through another perspective. That is their symmetry, their body plan. We can also classify organism according to their body plan. It helps in understanding them easily and we can trace back their ancestry also through it. So when a vertical section divides, multiple vertical section can divide the body into equal halves. Like you can see, there are multiple such vertical sections coming out and dividing this polyp into equal halves. There is one plane going like this, there is one plane go li going like this, there is one plane going like this. Multiple such vertical planes and you'll get, you are getting equal halves. That kind of symmetry is called as the radial symmetry. The organism which possess this radial symmetry, we group them into radiata. There is a type of radial symmetry where only two planes divide the body into equal halves, not multiple, but only two vertical planes divide the body into equal halves. The two planes in this case are the pharyngeal plane and tentacular plane. This is the example of phylum tenophora. 
which was at one point classified together with Nigeria, but now has been separated. Phylum Tenophora includes comb jellies, and this organism, uh, one organism that is that belongs to it, is Pleurobrachia. So, in Pleurobrachia, there are only two vertical planes: the pharyngeal and tentacular plane that can divide the body into two equal halves. There is no third vertical plane that can do that, and hence it's a type of bi a type of radial symmetry which we call as biradial symmetry. These two can be grouped together into radiata because they have that radial symmetry in their body plan. Then, like you and I, in us only one vertical plane can divide the body into two equal halves. Similar to what this insect, this bug has, only one plane in this arthropod insect can divide the body into two equal halves. This kind of symmetry is called as bilateral symmetry and thus all the organism that possess bilateral symmetry can be grouped together under bilateria. Then you do find that there may be lack of symmetry altogether. For example, in poriferins, sponges, there is no vertical plane that can pass through the body that can divide the body into equal halves and that kind of symmetry or lack of it is called as asymmetry. Then in certain unicellular groups as we had seen, this one is a heliozoan. which has those straight axis like pseudopodia called as axopodia and this has what is called as spherical symmetry. So, if any plane from any side vertical transverse, but it has to pass from the center, any plane passing from the center will divide the body into equal halves. And that kind of symmetry is referred as spherical symmetry. You find all those types of symmetry and within that bilateria and radiata some organisms may modify to have asymmetry, they may modify to have spherical symmetry, but you do group the organisms, the metazone, you can group them into radiata and bilateria. Moving ahead, we can also group these organisms on the basis of their development and whether they have a body cavity or not. The body cavity apart from the gut cavity, so there is a gut cavity which starts from your mouth ends up in anus or may just blindly end and there may not be an anus. But there has to be a, if there is a uh, gut uh, cavity that is apart from that, uh, there is a cavity which is apart from that gut cavity, then that cavity is called a coelom. If you look at this sectional view, the gastrula, a longitudinal section of this gastrula, you can see that. You have cut this gastrula, you can see the three germ layers. The germ layers are those cells organizing them into the three layers. The germ layers uh, would can be the ectoderm, the endoderm, and then there may be in certain groups a uh, mesoderm also. If there is no mesoderm, that kind of organism would be called as diploblastic because it has only two germ layers. If there is a mesoderm, the organism would be called as triploblastic. So right now you can see the development of a triploblastic organism. And in a gastrula, if you take a longitudinal sectional view, you will see that there is an outer blue colored ectoderm, the yellow colored endoderm and there are groups of cells here which are marked as red, which are the early mesoderm cells. If they start dividing and this opening is called as blastopore and this is leading into this cavity which will develop into gut cavity. But there can be different ways the gastrula can develop from here on. This mesodermal cell can just fill up this whole cavity and thus there would not be any coelom and that kind of situation is a coelomate pattern. The flatworms, platyhelminths belong to this kind 
of group they are acelomate because once that gastrula was forming those mesodermal cells they fill up this cavity all together and after that you will not find any other cavity other than the gut cavity the other situation can be where the cells start dividing and they line the insides of the ectoderm but they do not line the outsides of the endoderm so here the blue colored cell i am repeating were the ectoderm yellow were the ect uh, endoderm and those red were the mesoderm so these mesodermal cells they surrounded the insides of the body wall the ectoderm but they didn't surround the endoderm and hence it's not a complete surrounding of the mesoderm only parts of that mesoderm exist the coelom is not enveloped by that mesoderm because on one side there is an endoderm the other side there is a mesoderm this kind of situation keeps that coelom there but that coelom since it's not lined by mesoderm throughout would be called as pseudo coelom and that pseudo coelom is a characteristic of nematodes or round worms the third situation could be where those cells they start to divide and they form these this mass of cells which eventually will split and a cavity develops in between them and then they spread and cover the insides of the outer body wall and the outsides of the inner gut wall so they have surrounded the ectoderm you can see and they have surrounded the endoderm also and the cavity that had appeared in between them is now the coelom so now this kind of coelom is called as schizo coelom schizo means split so a coelom that is derived by splitting of those mesodermal cells is called as the schizo coelom that is a true coelomate annelids arthropods mollusks they fall into that category of schizo coelomata another way that can happen uh, this can happen is that when those cells that are going to become the mesoderm they are appearing from the gut only so you can see here this was the endoderm and certain cells in the endoderm now are trying to evaginate they are making these pouches and then this pouch separates and the cavity that it encloses within it is now the coelom and then that will also spread and cover the insides of the outer body wall and the outsides of the gut wall making the coelom which has appeared from the gut that's why enterocoelom uh coelom derived from the out pocketing of primitive gut so the organisms the metazoans can also be grouped into acelomates pseudo coelomates and true coelomates and whenever we write the word the two alphabets eu in front of any word it becomes true so u coelomate is true coelom and they are categorized into schizo coelomates and entero coelom we saw how they are forming only triploblastic organism would have that mesoderm and hence that presence of coelom or absence of it let's now begin with that phylum porifera so the word porifera comes from the pores that means pore bearing in them the body is covered with small pores called as ostia and a bigger pore usually a single in number sometimes it may be more than one but usually it is singular so we call it as osculum it, if it is more than one we will say oscula but usually it is just one so there are multiple smaller pores all over the body and that are called as ostia and a bigger pore called as osculum the true uh na animal nature of these organism was not known it was only no, uh, discovered by robert e grant he proved that whenever he used carmine particles and he you know released those carmine particles around a sponge 
then slowly he saw that all those carmine particles have disappeared and after some time they come out from the osculum as you can see here a fluorescent dye fluorescent green dye has been used to replicate the same experiment that robert e grant had done so those car uh, those that dye which was spread around enters through ostia and then comes out through osculum and with that the animal nature of poriferins was established then the question comes there has to be some current that is generated inside the body which is pulling that water in and then removing it out the current is generated through this specialized cell that is called as coanocyte this coanocyte or also known as collar cell since it has a collar has a basal granule and a flagellum and this beating of flagellum creates that current inside the body which brings which removes the water from the body and brings more water inside the body poriferins are diploblastic having only two germ layers they have a cellular grade of organization very simple pattern and they have unique canal system so if you cut a longitudinal sectional view of a simple sponge such as leucosolenia you'll find that the inside lining the cavity inside which is called as spongocele is lined by those coanocyte which beat and bring that water in and release that water out of the osculum and this creates a network of canals which is called as canal system and in poriferins there are different types the simplest one shown here is the ascon type of canal system then you have sicon and then you have leucon canal system from here to here when you go from ascon to leucon the complexity in the body wall increases it undergoes evaginations invaginations and these coanocytes can get restricted in particular sections of the body there are different diversity of these sponges and they also have a skeletal system inside them they do not have a proper endoskeleton but they may have those calcareous spicules not only cal they are not only calcareous since they can be made up of both calcium carbonate and silica and different shapes as you can see uh, are there sphere disk shaped all these pointy edges and then there can be another type of endoskeletal structure that is called as spongin fibers so sponges uh, which is the common name of poriferins can have either spicules or spongin fibers they may lack both of them as well there is a lot of diversity one example is leucosolenia the second well known example is sicon and then you have some beautiful examples such as this this is euplectella also known as venus flower basket this structure this sponge is known as the glass sponge the body has siliceous spicules and thus makes the appearance glassy and what be beautiful thing that happens here is here in these kind of sponges which are called as glass sponges they are grouped into a category called as hexactenellida in them the osculum gets covered by a plate so the osculum osculum is covered by the sieve plate there are multiple ostia opening throughout the body and there is one osculum which gets covered by a sieve plate now this shrimp spongy cola which belongs to phylum arthropoda it's a crustacean when it is in its juvenile stage the male female pair and they end, they are able to enter through the ostia into the body of this euplectella now what happens there is that when they reach inside the body they find that there is luxury there there is lot of food because the coanocytes are beating the food is coming in through that water current they get refuged there and hence they do not leave they keep eating they keep uh, growing in size they mate their larval forms exit out of the body and start their own uh, uh, mating and another cycle but when they grow together they increase in size and at one point of time they are not able to leave the euplectella body and hence this is a union till death a union for eternity that's what japanese call it 
they say uh, they use a term kairu doketsu which is union for eternity and thus they present this as a wedding gift japanese do that demonstrating that the marriage is union for eternity what a wonderful organism let's move ahead to phylum nidiria the word comes from the term night which means a nettle a nettle is a herbaceous plant which is covered with stings and that's what nidarians are they are diploblastic organisms they have only two germ layers the ectoderm and endoderm and that is separated by a mesoglea which is very gelatinous and hence a lot of them have very gelatinous jelly like appearances jellyfish is belong to this phylum they have specialized stinging cells called as nidocytes and in these cells the golgi apparatus modifies into stinging organelles called as nematocysts and ha they have toxin which they can release and then that they use for killing a pre uh, prey or they can use it for even escaping a predator in phylum nidiria there are two types of individuals that are found in the life cycle one which is sedentary and attached to the substratum that are polyps and one which are free swimming that are medusae the life cycle alternates between polyps and medusa so polyp makes medusa medusa can form polyp although individually polyps can also bud and create more uh, they can create their clones this process of alternation between polyp and medusa and then medusa and polyp is called as metagenesis so metagenesis is a characteristic of nidiria polyps usually reproduce through asexual reproduction although they can also reproduce sexually some colonies exhibit division of labor and that characteristic is called as polymorphism so within a colony there might be certain polyps which are only meant for capturing the food they are meant for uh, digesting it and assimilating it one polyp will be meant for only reproducing the third one would be meant for only uh you know protecting the colony so that is called as polymorphism this is not restricted to only polyp it can be found in medusae we should not confuse polymorphism with metagenesis metagenesis is that polyp making medusa medusa making polyp again but within polyp these forms are uh, and within medusa these forms are called as polymorphism so one which is doing uh, reproduction is called as a gonozoid or gonodendron one which is doing uh, the feeding is called as gastrozoid one which is doing protective function is called as dactylozoid and hence within a polyp you will find three different structures which can do all these functionalities sexual reproduction by gametes occurs in all medusae and it can also occur in some polyps and after the sexual reproduction there is a larval stage that is formed and that larval stage is called as planula larva this is a very interesting example and this shows di a huge polymorphism this is physelia also known as portuguese man of war the reason for calling it portuguese man of war is that it looks like when it is floating in the sea it looks like a 18th century portuguese warship in its full sail and this is one structure the sail part of that uh physelia called as pneumatophore and underneath it there are individual units and each unit has these units are called as cormedium the plural form would be cormedia and each unit has a reproductive structure called as gonodendron a structure which is meant for feeding called as gastrozoid gonodendron has both male as well as female reproductive parts there are tentacles which are meant for protective role and then this makes one unit called as cormedia cormedium and series of cormedia are arranged under that pneumatophore or float showing polymorphism in this medusae stage you find different kinds of organisms under uh, nidiria physelia obelia and this jellyfish orelia they are called as jellyfish because their body has that mesoglea which is gelatinous in orelia there is a male and female jellyfish separate 
which release sperm and ova in the sea and then that leads to formation of that planula larva which eventually settles down to the substrate and builds this polyp which is called as siphistoma this siphistoma undergoes budding and forms this strobila and each of this bud can separate and form this larva that is called as the ephyra larva and this ephyra larva eventually grows to form that large jellyfish this polyp stage only survives for a short period of time and then majority of the time it's the medusa stage these organism or jellyfishes are grouped under a class called as cyphozoa in which the medusa stage is more prominent compared to the polyp stage although both of them exist then under nidiria you also have anthozoans in anthozoa class you will find that there is no medusa there is only this polypoid structure that comes out and it will grow through budding it can grow through uh, sexual reproduction also but one beautiful thing that it does is during its life it is able to take calcium carbonate strontium sulfate silica from the sea from the ocean and then incorporate it in their body or outside their body and when they die they leave behind that calcareous or siliceous material on which other polyps can grow that slowly and gradually builds up what is called as coral reefs and thus those coral reefs are a very important marine ecosystem where a lot of fishes and other animals crustaceans some invertebrates they come reside they take refuge they eat they rest there these coral reefs are found throughout the tropics some can also be found in the temperate areas currently threatened by climate change and pollution and with their decimation the all the life that they are supporting will also go extinct let's move on from those nidiria to phylum tenophora tenophores were one uh, point of time grouped with uh, the nidirians one thing that i must tell you the nidirians do not have any anus they only had mouth leading into a large gastrovascular cavity so lower forms we say they have mouth leading into a uh, blindly ending cavity but no anus that's what we presume tenophora also had the word comes from teens which are comb plates so they are teen bearing or comb plate bearing organism one unique thing that occurs here is that there is an anal pore the mouth leads into a pharynx and then a lot of gastrovascular canals and they end up in one or two anal pores the waste from the body after digestion can exit both from mouth as well as through that anal pore it was earlier believed that this anal pore is non functional but recently in 2016 a paper in current biology proved that this anal pore is fully functional and with that now a problem comes because the next phylum in the hierarchy is phylum platyhelminths which does not have an anus and when we are classifying them we are classifying from a lower group which has a simple body and then we are moving ahead to a complex body plan and thus we are putting we were putting tenophora somewhere in between presuming that their anal pore is non functional but with this discovery that the anal pore is functional should we be keeping tenophora at the place that it is currently or should we remove it move it ahead only time will tell how that hierarchy is changed but coming back to these tenophores they were grouped together with uh, uh, nidiria for the reason that they also have a that gastrovascular cavity but unlike them here there is an anal pore also they also sometimes show nidocytes but the thing is that nidocytes if they have it that's not their own they often feed on other nidirians and then they take the uneverted nidocytes in their body and they use it for their own defense when they are moving you'll see those comb plates moving these are cilia plates of cilia that they use for locomotion they also may have tentacles 
they are thus referred due to their shape they are referred as sea walnuts and due to those comb plates they are referred as comb jellies that's their common name they are also diploblastic only two germ layers they also have their own specialized cell which are called as coloblasts and these are adhesive cells they release some adhesive substance which then covers their tentacles and then these tenophores can use it to catch a prey in their life cycle they also have a larval form called as sidipid larva that resembles the certain larval forms of platyhelminths and there that connection can also be seen and that evolutionary ancestry can be traced moving ahead to now a triploblastic organism which lacks an anus here we are at phylum platyhelminths the word comes from platy which means flat helminths which means worms so these are flat worms they do not have one particular character that we can unite them with but you yes there are certain patterns which are similar in all of them they can be marine they can be fresh water they can be found in moist terrestrial habitats also the previous phylum that you saw they were largely marine poriferans can be fresh water also like spongilla is a fresh water form but here they can be marine they can be fresh water they can be found in terrestrial ecosystem they can be free living they can be parasitic they have bilateral symmetry only one vertical plane divides the body into two equal halves they have definite polarity of anterior posterior region and body is flattened dorso ventrally it is compressed the three germ layers ectoderm endoderm mesoderm is present but the condition was the like that the mesoderm fills the body cavity and thus there is no coelom and thus they are acoelomates the free living forms in their epidermis have these structures called as rhabdites when these free living forms which are called as turbellarians they they are grouped into this class turbellaria when they feel threatened they release these rhabdites in water and then they dis dissolve in water and make the water distasteful so that any predator would not attack gut is incomplete may be branched but never ends up in anus it ends up blindly in a sac and then can be completely absent in the tapeworms called as cystodes nervous system is there and that's very important characteristic and thus you can say that they have moved from the tissue to organ uh, uh, level of uh, uh, organization or sometimes even systems may be there the nervous system has an anterior pair of ganglia with longitudinal nerve cords and thus due to that anterior location of that ganglia the civilization or appearance of head has started not a true head but still and thus that anterior posterior demarcation has also started most forms have male and female reproductive parts within the same body and thus they are called as monoecious they have they have a specialized cells for excretion that are called as flame cells or protonephridia lot of that diversity you can see there here you can see a very long cystode or tapeworm called as tinea tinea solium tinea saginata many of these this actually summarizes sort of the diversity that can exist though there are free living forms as well but you have a lot of parasitic forms under flatworms in the first picture you can see a snail and the highlighted portion the tentacles of the snail has this leucochloridium sporocyst this is a flatworm and its larval form called as sporocyst resides in those tentacles and thus create that rhythm rhythmicity pulsation in that uh, tentacles of that snail here you can see a ct scan of a, a person who passed away from neurocystic sarcosis and a lot of cysts can be found in the brain these are the cysty circus larva that is of a tapeworm tinea solium then you see a kinococcus another tapeworm that can infect humans although resides in dogs goats sheep but can infect humans as well and this is a liver infected with the kinococcus 
here you can see a child with protruded belly because the fluid has accumulated inside the belly and has created a condition called as ascites this is due to a blood worm blood fluke called as schistosoma and the disease is called as schistosomiasis this is one such flatworm where the male and female are separate although the female resides within the male's body uh, in a gynecophoric canal but this is one example where the male and female is separate you don't find such dioecious forms in platyhelminths then this is a wonderful example riberia riberia is again a fluke which has multiple larval forms uh, moving from a bird's gut to the pond water and then infects a tadpole which develops into a frog and when it develops into a frog this uh, this parasite can cause the frog to develop multiple legs thus hindering the movement of that frog and when the movement of that frog is hindered what happens is the it is easy for a bird to come and then eat it up this is a beautiful mechanism through which this parasite can continue to live and continue its life cycle by paralyzing this frog ribera is the name and finally we come to the conclusion with pseudocoelomates pseudocoelomates do not have a true coelom though they have a body cavity apart from the gut cavity but it is not fully lined by mesoderm earlier they were grouped into a phylum called as eschelminthes but turns out they were very all those organisms that were grouped in eschelminthes were very diverse and were not all pseudocoelomates so that phylum is now redundant now we have the phylum nemathelminths which was earlier nematoda nemathelminths means rounded uh, body round worm they are triploblastic so the three germ layers are there but the coelom is not true though it is present but it's not a true coelom since it's not lined by mesoderm through and through they have an organ system a level of organization because you find digestive reproductive nervous excretory all these organs but they do lack circulatory and respiratory uh, systems all those sy other systems are there they also have a process called as uteli where once they have developed they have a fixed number of cells in their body there is a huge diversity of nemathelminths you find it everywhere in marine ecosystem in fresh water in soil in thin film over the soil and their numbers there are lot of them are not yet discovered so in future we might find more such numbers of nemathelminths the outer body is covered with a non cellular cuticle and they have two type of sensory structure one anterior in location called as amphids one posterior in location called as phasmids nematodes are dioecious the male and female are separate and the males are smaller in size compared to the females they also have a copulatory spicules at the end the males which they use to copulate with the females lot of diversity again a lot of them again are parasite one such example is escheris which is a parasitic worm infecting humans causing escheriasis Ascaris lumbricoides is the name. Here you can see the female is much bigger in size compared to the male. Male's posterior end is rounded, and there is a protruding copulatory spicule as well. Sometimes the infection is so much that the whole intestine can be blocked by these worm, and then that can lead to gangrenous intestine. This child with the protruded SIT stomach is also a symptom that appears due to Ascaris infection. Ascaris eggs can last for years in open, and thus open defecation should be banned. Reason being that if we defecate op in open and all that ascaris infection keeps spreading, that egg will remain in the soil for a very long time, leading to those reinfections and spreading of those infections. But the th good thing is that these are. Uh, diseases these parasites can be removed from your body they are completely treatable you need to take certain drugs such as albendazole ivermectin and then you will eliminate this uh, organism from your body but timely intervention is what is needed so with that everyone we come to the conclusion of our lecture 
from protest to pseudo silomate though it is just a tip of the iceberg of what the diversity of these organisms are but understanding an overview will help you to read further thank you